comprised of bankers, farmers, nurses, teachers, engineers, and policy makers into this millennium and to be far better equipped to not only participate in, but lead in this era of new global health. Michelle and her team work as authors, speakers, policy makers, educators, and above all, advocates of human rights. Working through the power of care, the power of nursing, as change agents for a healthier world. After all, that power of care is inside every person. Imagine the potential for good that we have yet to actualize, yet to mobilize. Let's make life work for 100% of humanity. 100% of the time. Let's no longer tolerate the preventable loss of 15 children in this minute. Michelle Fair. Well, thank you very much. And what a privilege and pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Jamie, for making this possible. And especially at the end of a busy day that you're all here. So thank you to the audience as well. And it's really quite a privilege. It, can everybody hear me OK? Are we golden? OK. Uh, it's quite a privilege to be able to talk to people who obviously have an interest in global health and who have an interest in sharing information across borders. Uh, sorry that you read the whole thing, but thank you for doing so. Um, it's really interesting to me how we go about this idea of global health. I kind of have a, three phases to my life. The first phase, I grew up global. I grew up as what's called an MKN. Has anybody ever heard of Morrison Knudsen? Uh, Bechtel, big companies. My uh, uh, father and my grandparents, it was just second nature to me. We were always jetting off somewhere. Uh, somebody was being born someplace. And it was odd to me that people thought that globalization was somehow new. And so I, I realized that I had a little bit of an advantage in seeing things, but that was the first phase of my life. The second phase of my life, I'm just going to label Haiti today. And the third phase is where I am now on this journey to global health. I'd like to begin by sharing this quote from Dr. Paul Farmer. After all, we're talking mountains beyond mountains here. And his quote is basically that death is a side effect of our not moving fast enough. I'm not sure this is completely right. I think there's times we don't move fast enough, and death definitely is a side effect of that. But I'd like to challenge you to think today about our global health models, about our international aid models. And are we not just doing things right, but are we doing the right things? And so I'm thinking that perhaps in my experience in the phases of my life that I've gone through with my experiences with global health, I'm not sure it's that we're not moving fast enough. We've got to be careful the direction we're moving in and how we're doing so. What I hope that each of you wants for yourself, to me, this is the ultimate definition of global health. What I want for me, I want for you. What we want here in the United States for our families, for our friends, for our neighbors, and our communities, to me, the ultimate definition of global health is that is what we want for everyone. And I would love to tell you a little story here quickly about this darling little girl you're looking at. She's five years old. And you can see she's got a pretty darling smile on her face. That particular day, I had encountered three little five-year-old girls. And this was the last one I saw that day. The bones were sticking out of her hand. And because of the swelling, her skin was uh, split apart, and it was pretty badly infected. That face doesn't look like it, does it? What she was so happy was that she was alive and that she was getting a bandage. And her mother was so proud she was getting a bandage. What I want for myself, what I want for my children is excellent care. And I want them to get the care they need when they need it. I want them to have a safe place to live. I want them to have a good education. And that's the same thing I want for this beautiful little girl who is an absolute delight. And as I poked the bones back into the, her skin, she just kind of did that a little bit. And then, of course, said thank you and gave me a giant hug. So we should want the same thing. That's what global health is all about. So our title today is 15 in this minute. In this time that we are together, if you just like to keep track of that clock up there for every minute that passes, 15 children will die from preventable causes. Now, it's about 8 million children a year, or totally about 11 million children, according to the World Health Organization, die each year. And of those, over 80%, it's preventable. 
So as you're moving into the world of global health and this is what you're interested in, this should be your charge. What's our measure? So the World Health Organization, 8 million preventable, 11 million total. And so the ones that are not preventable would be things like genetic disorders, uh, uh, not viable births, et cetera. So why me? I introduced myself just a little bit that I've got some global experience. I used to play, any of you played Spin the Globe? You know what that is, Spin the Globe? And you, you pretend you're not looking, and then you put your hand where you want to go, and you hope you're going to get there. Well, I used to always make the globe stop on the South Pacific. And uh, it was really fun. We ended up living there. I lived in New Guinea, had great adventures, we had scuba diving, all kinds of great things. And that was my spin the globe thing. And of course, I was influenced by Pearl S. Buck. Familiar with her work? Magnificent author, a lot of work about China. And I was like, well, that's where I'm going to go work. And sure enough, I've had the great good fortune to do that. I will honestly tell you that I thought I had global health figured out. Um, I grew up in uh, places like Venezuela, uh, and my sister was in Peru. We were all over the South Pacific and uh, New Guinea. I lived later in my life in Indonesia and worked there as a public health nurse for three years. Uh, I just was in love with the Orient, and that's where I was going to go, and that's what I did. So I went there several times. And I would have honestly told you that I have this paradigm, this understanding of what global health is. So. Um, it was pretty fun here. How many of you climbed a coconut tree? Okay, you don't know global health till you climb a coconut tree, right? Right? Cuts the spit out of you, doesn't it? <laughs> so some great adventures thought I knew of what I was speaking. When we think about global health, how many of you think global health is new? That's relief. Uh, we keep hearing the new global health, and we'll talk about what that means in just a minute because these phases of my life, I think, are, uh, I'd like to share with you what this means with health equity and social justice. I'm pretty sure this gentleman who was a slave in Haiti in the 1800s would have told you, or maybe he's a slave in the United States, irregardless. I don't think he would have said globalization is new. I think when he was put on a ship and, and drug out of the Horn of Africa or wherever uh, the, the western coast of Africa, I don't think he would have told you globalization is new. And as if, if the Tiano Indians of Hispaniola were still around, they would tell, would tell you that globalization isn't new. Annihilated by slavery and things like measles, they're gone. So globalization is not new. And again, I thought I had that pretty well figured out. My grandmother, by the way, was rescued on camelback in Kandahar, Afghanistan from one warring Bedouin tribe from another. So it's just something I thought everybody knew this. And I know we talked before, I believe in one of the other lectures, um, or maybe it was Brian Sippy talked to you about the number of people who travel in the United States is surprisingly low. Like only 5 to 10 percent actually go out of the United States. Did that surprise you? Okay. It surprised me because we used to sit on the airport wall and try to get blown over by the, the first the propellers and then the jets. And we had a friend, um, Joe Lucas, who came to our house one day in his little bow tie and blue suit and his ratty uh, little brown leather briefcase and said, pour me a scotch, it's my hundredth trip around the world. And that was back on pro, uh, propellered plane, prop planes. So, so this led me to thinking about a lot of stuff and I've been working in nursing now. This will be my 40th year starting in May. And a team and I have been working here in Montana on legislation, on rural, rural health equity, on uplifting people. And we thought, well, we'll develop some of these tools. But then we got looking a little bit further. So this is our, our symbol. The, you know, the, the nurse person here is our logo for Nurses for Nurses International. And we got thinking more deeply about our work here in Montana and said, well, we, you know what, we need to look and throw our net a little bit further. So this was the beginning of the end of my first phase of life. Because this is not an equal equation. If we know how to do this, if we, we say that our domain is care, whether that's in global public health, or that's in nursing or medicine, dentistry, mental health, regardless, what we provide in care has to be equitable and the equation should be balanced. 
And right now we have a little over 17 million nurses in the world. We're the largest healthcare workforce in the world. And what's really kind of cool about that, and I might be a little selfish here, I want to leverage nurses, because the majority of nurses are women. Now that's an important, powerful thing. 93 to 97 percent of nurses worldwide are women. And what area or what gender has the greatest disparities? Women. So why don't we start using nursing a little more powerfully? So if this is our paradigm, we stretched a, we threw a net and said, who has the worst of the worst? Now I'd traveled before and uh, I kind of thought I was going to go to southern Sudan. We'd done a little work there with, with them on consulting and we thought, that's probably where I'm going to go. Nursing probably has the toughest go there. It turns out the toughest go is Chad. Um, it's the toughest go for everything. Um, but in our own hemisphere, Haiti won the prize. Here in the United States, we have one nurse for about 110 persons that we consider almost a shortage. In Haiti, it's 1 to 12,000. So looking at all of the healthcare disparities, all the WHO data, when we decided with Nurses for Nurses International to go take a gander at how we were going to apply our principles learn, excuse me, that we were learning, Haiti came up as the prize. I didn't really want to go, which was interesting about me. I'd uh, studied and worked and we developed relationships. Took about a year to find the right place to go to work in Haiti. Um, if we ever have a chance to talk again, I was developing this horrible sense of dread about December of 2009. I'd been making arrangements for a year and a half and I was excited to go. Then all of a sudden I was just smacked with dread and nightmares, couldn't sleep. So I said, well, you know, I got to go anyway. And um, off we went. So sometimes just stepping out and trying to understand what you're going to be doing, uh, you don't have to have the whole puzzle piece. You don't have to know everything that you're going to be doing and how it's going to work out. And you'll see in a second that I sure didn't. So there's the capital marked with the star, Port-au-Prince. Anyone been to Haiti? Okay. Um, a lot of people here in Missoula have been to Haiti. Um, that this is where I was headed, Laogon, Haiti, and there was a school of nursing there. It's the only baccalaureate school of nursing, and I was headed there to see what it would take to teach a public health nursing course. And flying into Haiti is really quite beautiful. It's like flying over any other Caribbean island. Uh, it, it looks kind of nice from the sky, and as you get closer, you start seeing, well, there's not many trees, and you see this beautiful canopy of um, uh, tin and uh, blue tarps and and whatnot. Uh, but this is landing in Port-au-Prince outside the, the window there. By the way, if you ever go, go American, don't go Delta. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Delta doesn't have toilet paper. They don't pay their bills. Anyway, um, this is me arriving in Port-au-Prince on January 12th at two on 2010 at about 4.40 p.m. Uh, uh, I was just outside the airport and this is beautiful, incredible Martha and this is Evans. They're both nurses and they had just graduated from nursing school. So we're all happy we're meeting each other and here in this little white van we're hopping in that and um, as soon as we got in the van the earthquake hit and a hit is the right term. You could feel the, the plates one against the other. It was really violent. It was surprising that in fact that the van didn't tip over. Uh, this ambulance in front of us, this no, no way does this picture uh, do justice to the chaos that we were surrounded with. There was fires, things were exploding, buildings were falling down, people were screaming, blah, 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 blah. But uh, what was so impressive with this ambulance is we couldn't figure out where they were going because all the hospitals pretty much had been destroyed. And there was a father hanging on for dear life holding his little unconscious daughter. And he had one foot uh, against the door so he wouldn't fall out. and one hand he was hanging on and that was absolutely packed with people. It, the distance between Port-au-Prince to Leogon is only about 20 miles and it took us a little over seven hours to, to make that trip and um, it's pretty, pretty gnarly. Now, the world didn't understand that Port-au-Prince was not the epicenter. Uh, it has since become known as the Leogon Fault and it just happened to be where we were going was the epicenter. It, and there's a whole series of weirdness why I even got in that van and went and didn't go to the U.S. Embassy. But I did and it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. But we're now moving into phase two. Because if you want to know healthcare injustice, if you want to know disparity, if you want to know the dark, ugly pit 
then you understand the experience of what happened here. This was a Sunday school teacher who was sure I could save her arm. And she had gotten all of the little preschoolers out of her, her classroom. This arm was filled with pink paint. She had just finished painting it. She was so happy with her pink paint. And of course, she thought I could save this arm. And of course, I, I couldn't, but she refused to go to a doctor because she believed I would, simply because I was Caucasian and simply because I was Caucasian. That's about it. Didn't take much more than that for her to believe in health care at that level. And you can see I'm pretty befuddled there. It took me hours to actually face this arm and to be able to work with her. And she kept coming back. Um, so um, we took care of close to 5,000 people. We couldn't understand why aid wasn't showing up. Um, this was the lawn that was our hospital. Nobody would go inside. And I know that just looks like a lawn to you. Um, but there were people wall to wall. You just turn from one to the next to the next. And this is a little idea. We'd already picked up that trash that day. Um, for every pair of gloves you see there, for every bandage you see there uh, is a human being. And multiply that times hundreds across that lawn. And imagine if this were your family. This is Leogon Haiti. This was the military. Um, photo that was taken, that long red stripe is the school where we were at. The other two areas is where everyone went to live. And that's uh, two football fields, a football field and a cathedral. This is a city of about 150,000 people. And it was 80 to 90% destroyed. Now, can you picture a Missoula 80 to 90% destroyed? Can you even wrap your head around that? Okay. So this is what the area became. Inside those tents, there was over 5,000 people living there uh, that had lost everything. And each one of these little tents served as a hospital. Inside was a patient or two or 10. Um, there were babies that had diarrhea because life continued to go on. There were babies being born. There were people having heart attacks. There were people without insulin and diabetes. There were people without their high blood pressure medications. And so this was the hospital we had to send them to. Now, this is the course. And you can well imagine how this might have impacted my life, how I thought I knew global health, how I thought I had it kind of figured out, how I'd done the research, how I understood how we work across borders. Do you know that I even took some courses and became certified as a transcultural nurse specialist? And, and, and that uh, I taught transcultural nursing. And I, I just think it's the funniest darn thing now to think that anybody is culturally competent. So look at this disparity. You can't even imagine the suffering these people went through and how it impacted me, how it changed my life. Um, cutting off a five-year-old's hand with an X-Acto knife. What do you do with that? And where was the aid? And why didn't the aid know that the earthquake center was in Leogon? And why did it take so long? Turns out the world was building docks to get ships in so they could get heavy equipment in. I didn't know that. I just didn't know where they were. Turns out they were amassing Marines to bring in all the food supplies and build hospitals. I didn't know that. I just knew nobody was coming. When the helicopters came over, I wanted to pitch a rock at them. But what's the phase two that really disturbs me? This is JICA, by the way. It's the largest humanitarian aid agency in the world. I did not know that. I would have told you that the Red Cross was, or that MFF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, perhaps was. But actually, the Japanese International Cooperation Agency is phenomenal. If you ever have the opportunity to work with these folks, they are remarkable. They know how to work with people. And in a blink of an eye, they came in with all these supplies. And what's in those bags? A hospital. And they blew that hospital up, and it was fully stocked in no time at all. But why, ladies and gentlemen, can we do this? Why are we so good at rescuing? Why are we so good at the trauma and drama? Because that's where we spend all our dollars, right? 92% of our health care dollars here in the United States goes to acute care. So it's why can we do this? And we couldn't have prevented the, the people that had that massive arm infection, or the gentleman in that center photo had maggots and apologized for asking for a second bandage. Why couldn't we be on the front end of this? Because this is what the hospital became from our lawn to this 
in about six hours, the Japanese team had this blown up. And everything's there. They've even got a biohazard bag. They've got a full pharmacy. They've got anesthesiology. They've got lighting. They had generators. They had more Ritz crackers than any Costco on the face of this earth. So if we can do this, you see, why aren't we getting better on the front end? So as you can appreciate, this changed my trajectory. What I thought I knew about global health, what I thought we'd known about developing policies and education and projects really changed. And um, I was evacuated on Martin Luther King Day. Um, that in and of itself was an amazing experience. So what would you do with something like this? How would this challenge you? What, what would change in your life? And how would you rectify the chasms? Would it be a nice service learning trip? Would you go on one of those mission trips? What would you do with this new information of what truly unjust global health is or health inequity and what I want for myself, I want for someone else? What would you do that's different? And I'll be honest with you now, this is moving into my phase two of my life, is I don't have all the answers. And if I leave you with anything today, I hope you know none of us have the answers. So let's work together to figure this out. Because when nothing remains, this is uh, a street there in Leogon. My friend Regan lives on one corner. Look at this. Over 230,000 people are gone. Uh, thousands and thousands are disabled. Uh, the amputees and whatnot, it, it's sickening. They, ha they got you know, some basic equipment, but the atrophy, it, it's been pretty awful. Businesses were destroyed. Uh, there's no government left. The public services of any kind are gone. Churches are gone. Nothing was really safe. You couldn't go back in buildings. And no hospitals, clinics. Where would you begin? So if we do the same thing over and over again with our public health, with our models, and with the way we look at global health, if we continue these uh, two week go into the country and provide a medical model, is that right? If we uh, do mass immunization clinics, there's one gentleman who raised millions of dollars to get a sailboat and go around the Caribbean and pass out um, uh, deworming medication. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And so we have to think deeply about this. And what's been happening with me and on the team as to, to consider, is it right to go into a country and provide a little bit of aid and then leave? If it cost me $5,000 to go to Haiti and get a driver and get some basic meals and accommodation, uh, is that accommodation, excuse me, not a combination. Is that a good use of funds? Did I help those people $5,000 worth? So these are the questions and of course the ethic and morality of working across borders is uh, quite a challenge. So is it a lack of international aid? Is it a lack of enough international aid? There's a lot of controversy. I hear people talking about how many folks have gone to Haiti, how much money has gone to Haiti. And I do have to tell you some excellent work has been done. Some really fantastic things have happened. Um, but Haiti, as you might know, is known as a republic of NGOs, non-government organizations. Prior to the earthquake, there were anywhere between three and 5,000 NGOs registered as working in Haiti. Today, there's 12 to 15 to 20 to 30,000. And it could have been one person started an NGO. I went through the airport the first time going to Haiti. There was nobody in the terminal. It was me and a couple other uh, Caucasians and then mostly some Haitians. It was very quiet, nobody there. The next time I went, a few months after the earthquake, it was packed wall to wall with every color of T-shirt you could imagine. This cause, that cause. And what kind of shocked me was how young the audience that was going really was. And I thought, man, they need engineers. They need people who know how to dig. They need people who know epidemiology. They need people who know how to go to work and have some real skills. But honest, there were, there were girls with pink fluffy pillows. And I thought, is this OK? Well, obviously, it wasn't to me. It wasn't OK. And so I talked to a couple of them. I said, well, why are, you, why are you going to Haiti? These people barely have enough food and water, and they're living in tents and on the street. What, what are you going to go do? I didn't say it that way. They were going to hold babies. I thought, OK, 
That's an interesting paradigm. And so a republic of NGOs, how might that interfere with the government's actions? How might that interfere with, for example, Dr. Delson Macier, who is a maternal child health physician who is building a practice, who had the trust of women, and suddenly these volunteer doc and he has to make a, a living, so he needs to be paid for his work. Suddenly, there's all these NGOs that come in that provide the free maternal child health, and he's out of business. And he can't make a living, and he has to leave. And then what happens when the NGOs pull out, and there's no Haitian maternal child health docs left? And what happens when I go into Haiti, and hey, I've got a dollar, I'm going to buy my papaya for a dollar. I just priced the Haitian people out of their papaya. And how about I go into Haiti with an NGO and lots of money, I've got you know, $500,000 in my pocket, I'm going to buy a clinic, I'm going to build a house, I'm going to build something, and I'm going to pay whatever you would like me to pay for that land. And I just priced Haitians out of their land. It's a big deal, NGOs. It's a very big deal. And we have to think deeply about this model and what we're doing. Because Haiti is the demonstration project for the worst and the best of international aid. This little girl, this is during Gustav, Hurricane Gustav. We have had almost a nonstop embargo against Haiti since she won her independence in 1804. And who suffers from embargoes? Why would we bother embargoing Haiti? They don't have any money, they don't have anything. It's the food supplies that got to this little person. And we starved thousands and thousands of people. The count was 800 died because of the embargoes. But this little girl is a result of embargoes. Is that part of global health, the policy and the politics? So let's take a look now. You can see that I'm challenged by how do we work here. So the life expectancy in Haiti is 55. Uh, there's 50% of the persons live in abject poverty, which is a less than a dollar a day, 80% in poverty, 75% unemployment. We have to be careful about that number because that means formal employment. Uh, in our research, we found 96% of the people in Haiti work, but they work in what's called informal occupations. So that would be bringing their fruits and vegetables to the market. Uh, or one woman buys kerosene from a supplier, then she resells it in the market. And that it's known as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, 57% illiteracy. And if we start looking at the social determinants of health, uh, water, built environment, economy, uh, it, it presents challenges. You probably all know this. And these people, by the way, are incredibly beautiful. Um, the population is over 9 million now. After the earthquake, one of the problems with NGOs was that there was a mass um, uh, urbanization went over, uh, they, they're guessing about two million people came to Port-au-Prince, not because they had been a victim of the earthquake, but because all the international aid was suddenly centered in Port-au-Prince and they knew they could get health care for their families. So now you've got two million extra people in Port-au-Prince, and that's a problem uh, because there's no septic system in Port-au-Prince, right? Um, and it's not much bigger than Maryland. Average age, 20.2, so you know it's a young population. Okay, average Haitian dies from these causes. And as you take a gander down this list, how many would you say are preventable? Kind of all of them, aren't they? Do we know how to deal with any of these? And there's even some evidence of the type of cancers that we're seeing a, a, a huge upswing in breast cancer in women in developing countries. There's some evidence it could be viral. We don't know why, if it's environmental. So it could be that all of these are preventable. And here in the United States, if a baby dies from diarrhea, that's just shocking, right? So children under uh, age five, the mortality rate is 10 times higher than the US and the uh, maternal mortality rate Look at that, 50 times higher than the U.S. Any moms in here? How would you like those odds to have a baby? What I want for me, I want for everyone. So healthcare in Haiti, uh, the basic health care services are out of reach of the majority of Haitians. And remember, we've got 12,000 some NGOs working in Haiti providing health care. Is it working? 
think about that disparity, okay? Hospitals where they exist often have minimal services. You can see here the people brought their own bedding and some of their own medications they have to bring in. Family members come in and take care of them. Hospital conditions since the earthquake are far improved, by the way. And um, I told you before, the ratio of nurses is 1 to 10,000 to 12,000. The ratio of physicians is better. Anybody got a wild idea why that might be? Why there is one physician for every 5,000 persons? And think what's nearby. Cuba. Cuba is nearby, and Cuba has a dearth of physicians. And they actually ship them off to Haiti and have had an agreement. When we embargoed Haiti and, uh, and we kicked the Cubans out and created all kinds of problems in Haiti, we actually undermined the healthcare system in Haiti because it was Cuban-based. It's very interesting. And I'll tell you, I worked with a couple of Cuban doctors. They were phenomenal, just phenomenal. And by, there's no way to really compare our gross national product to Haiti's gross national product. But 0.8% of their GNP is spent on health care. Ours, over 20% of our GNP is spent on health care. And of course, our GNP versus Haiti's GNP aren't even close. But um, that's a problem. So what drives me, and I imagine what drives you, and I imagine this quote fits for Peter and everyone who works in global health, uh, this wonderful quote from Martin Luther King Jr. of all forms of inequity. Injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. So where would you begin? What would you do? And we are driven by social justice, and we don't have all the answers to that. But unless we have a heartier dialogue about our models, of intervention, uh, we've, we've got some ways to go. Uh, this is Regan. He's one of our team members in Haiti. He's working on his nurse practitioner. Uh, this is how we worked. Uh, this woman's legs were absolutely exploded. So do the predominant models of aid and working across cultural borders work? And are they the right models? Uh, are they ethical? Is the return on investment correct? Um, I, I wear a little cross because of my, my personal beliefs, but I'm somebody who gets cold chills if someone talks to me about mission trips. I, I'm someone who wonders about service learning and what you're going for and what your intent is if you're going to feel better about yourself. Is that okay? When we go to countries, we're there as their guest. And so many people go, if I could give you a picture of what that airport looked like, it was in, in May of uh, 2010, so just five months after the earthquake. If I could give you a picture of that airport, everybody in there, and I mean hundreds of people packed to get on the different flights going to Haiti, they were going to go rescue Haiti. They were going to go take care, fix those people. And one of the things about Haiti that I have the privilege of knowing was working besides Martha, beside Martha and Regan. Haiti is her own hero. The people of Haiti love their country. And this can be true of Nicaragua, Honduras, Nepal, southern Sudan. What I'm talking about here works in lots of countries, in Bougainville and the Solomon Islands. How do we empower people and not be the ones going in to rescue or think we can go rescue. So if I, if I go in, it costs $5,000, what do you think I should do for that $5,000? Is that a good use of time and money? And what work am I doing when I'm there? And have, have we thought about that enough as, as an NGO culture here in the United States? I've got to tell you, my friend Junior, who got a scholarship, he's at Virginia Tech in agriculture. I was trying to explain to him fundraising so that he could get his airplane ticket back to Haiti. And he just started cracking up. He thought that was the funniest thing. He didn't know I was serious. And I said, no, Junior, really. You got to write letters and you got to post a flyer that says you're wanting to make money. You'll do work. You'll do some gardening. And he said, that's just really funny that you would do that. Because culturally, this idea, just imagine if a bunch of Haitians came to Missoula, Montana and started doing aid work. What, would, what does that sound like to you? Would you go sign up for their health care? Would you like to learn from them? And why is it any more bizarre that we go into another country? So they need our help, they want our help, they respect us, but how do we do this? 
and um, are we doing things right or are we doing the right things? And really understanding the difference. Because if there are 15,000 NGOs or 5,000 or 3,000 NGOs in Haiti, and Haiti is a republic of NGOs, then NGOs should be working. That model should be working. But it isn't. It's not that change. There's no septic system in Port-au-Prince. NGOs have been in Haiti for decades. So what is it we're missing? What is it we're missing? So I'd like to encourage us as we think about working across borders, stop seeing people as victims. Stop thinking that you have something more to offer them than they have to offer you. See Haiti differently, see Southern Sudan differently, see, see people differently. It is not an us and it is not a them. Because I can see Haiti in her poverty and her want and her wretchedness. Or I can see Haiti this way. And this is the way I see Haiti, of brilliant, kind, amazing human beings that love their country. I get notes from the mother all the time about how much they love Haiti and how proud they are of their country. And there's a big difference between this picture of Regan and that poverty, right? Isn't that what you normally see about Haiti? And when, after the earthquake, everything I heard was what all the Americans were doing or all the Europeans were doing. But I know what the Haitians were doing. They were really helping one another. Know what you stand for. Have you come down firmly on the idea, this is, of course is Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of the lead authors of the Human Rights Declaration, and Article 25 that talks about health care as a right. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and nece necessary social services, and the right to the security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack. And look at this, motherhood and childhood are entitled to a special care and assistance. Isn't that lovely? So how do we get our work behind that? How do we change the paradigm? And of course, all children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. Isn't that what you're doing in global health? And you'll be reminded of the Millennium Development Goals. The first one here doesn't say provide acute medical care. It doesn't say go in and rescue and slice and dice and drug. It says end poverty and hunger. So what if our job, no matter who we are, whether we work in medicine, we work in nursing, we work in uh, mental health, we work in policy and politics, what if there's no mistake here that this is the number one millennium development goal to end poverty? It's the greatest determinant of whether or not you're going to live long. Universal education, uh, gender equality, child health, maternal health. You guys all familiar with these Millennium Development Goals? World Health Organization, they're not quite sure if they're going to go with another round of Millennium Development Goals. These are kind of due to be measured and kind of up in 2015. So we'll, we'll see what the World Health Organization decides and its advisors. Environmental sustainability, and my favorite one, is global partnerships, because alone we can do nothing. So we're collaborating with Nurses for Nurses International. This is Madam Boy, who is the um, uh, Chief Nursing Officer with the Ministry of Health. And she has asked us to help develop standards. So in this phase of questioning, and I will be firm with you, I don't know the answers to global health and all of them. But unless we look at the models and question and look at the ethics and morality and the return on investment, we'll just be doing the same things over. Uh, in Haiti, a wonderful saying is combeat. And Komit means together. This is the symbol outside the airport. This is their national symbol of what Haiti stands for. And this um, comes from the uprising that led to their freedom in 1804. That's right outside the airport. So the new model, are you familiar with the social determinants of health? Anybody? Liz, yes? Well, now you will be. Now you will be. Because what we know is that it is not the measles 
by itself. It's not the surgery that we do. It's not, the, it's not even the cholera. It's not the infectious disease. What kills people are the social determinants of health. That is the conditions in which they live. So that puts us to task. Sir Michael Marmont, um, with, um, he was the chair of the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2008. And I hope you'll take the time to look at the WHO site. There's a self-directed study under PAHO's site on how to understand working with the social determinants of health. So this is what they are. Obviously, they're in economy. We know that people through Dr. Um, well, he's now Sir Marmont, uh, Sir Michael Marmont. Uh, he's in England. And we know that you can line up people and they can be the same weight. They can eat just about the same foods and uh, the same age. And the one who lives in poverty will die or be disabled before the person who has money, only variable that you need to change, okay? Any of you students have student loans and feel anxious about paying them back? How's that feel? Is it good to owe money? Is it hard to feel like you don't have enough? Maybe you guys are all pretty wealthy, I shouldn't assume that. You might all be wealthy students. If people have this chronic need to get their kids to school or just to be able to find food. It builds cortisols. It does things like diabetes and heart disease. So economy is a big deal. And then we've got education. That is also a, a clear determinant of health. With poor education, um, you'll die earlier than the person with education. No other variables need to be studied. Okay, policy and politics, environment, and built and natural, of course, transportation and safety. Uh, Haiti, go to any country in the world. I, if you've ever driven in Jakarta, that's a hoot and a holler, but it can be said for almost every um, developing country and, and their, their road system, and you'll see a lot of people injured. Um, behaviors, of course, recreation is very important. One of the things that makes Haiti so resilient is their love of music and family and getting together. And I've got to tell you, you have not had fun until you have played Farkle with a bunch of guys who just love to say Farkle. <laughs> And they still are asking me about UNO. So, and then, of course, the systems of health and social sciences uh, services. So these are the things that make people sick and not the disease itself. So um, I think we might be getting past time here, but here's a little YouTube. I'd encourage you to look up Sir Michael Marmont and the Whitehall Studies and the Social Determinants of Health. So if they are right that we've been looking at the wrong end of the stick, then we need to start developing aid models that are based on these social determinants of health and ask ourselves some harder questions. Obviously, number five, we need to use best practices. Um, this is the 10 essential public health services uh, model from the Centers for Disease Control. It says we, we, have, uh, we assess policy development and assurance and then the 10 essential services. Here in the United States, we're very lucky. We have the Public Health Accreditation Board that has recently set standards for accredited public health. So let's look to those. In Haiti, we're doing what's called the Nurses, Farmers, and the Millennium Development Goals, and we are using a model of social determinants of health. It's not easy because what most people want to do is go in, do their week or two a year, volunteer, and leave. And I understand that, and I think that's valuable. There's been a lot of good aid work. But when you think about taking a, a team of 10 in, you are talking $50,000. Now, should we, is that the right use of $50,000? And I don't know that, but I'm looking to you guys to have these hearty discussions and think about if there continues to be an abyss, what should we do? So we're conducting a uh, community health assessment because unbelievably, you want to take a, a wild guess at where the data that we have on Haiti comes from? Okay, in the Caribbean, over 7,000 islands, it's uh, quite an interesting microcosm, but there's two U.S. territories in the Caribbean, right? U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Therefore, they have a U.S. Census Bureau. Therefore, they have hospital reporting systems. They have taken the data from the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and extrapolated them and applied them to Haiti. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Does that sound a little crazy? So maybe what we have to do in healthcare 
is stop and do, I'm the first one to admit that the trauma and drama is sexy and exciting and you know, maybe Mr., what's the guy in Grey's Anatomy, Mr. Cutie Doctor? You know, maybe one of them will show up or something. I, I don't know the fascination, but I get it. I get it's more, you get more money if you're doing, sawing something off. Um, what if we start getting more upstream and thinking about the hard work of assessment and getting boots on the ground and working with people side by side? So what we're doing is a community health assessment. It's going to take a long, hard pull. We've got a tremendous team in Haiti. We're using the standards from the National Association of City County Health Departments, and we're using uh, some of Dr. Farmer's work, and we're using um, the standards in public health from CDC and the National Public Health Association, et cetera. And I tell you what, it's a trick, but we're finding just the opposite is true. For example, if you look at WHO data right now, it'll tell you that 80% of the population in Haiti are Roman Catholic. Now, if you start thinking of developing uh, a maternal child health program or perhaps a uh, family planning program, knowing that 90% are Roman Catholic is pretty important in how you're going to approach this. Well, we found that 79% are Protestant. That's very, very different in how we go about our work. So you got to get your, yourself on the ground and you got to do this. This is an easy work. It's trudging up and down mountains, it's talking to people, it's listening, and it's doing a community health assessment, then a community health improvement plan, and then a strategic plan. It will take two to five years to do. So it isn't as fun as running in with an aid organization, and is this the right model? I don't know. I'm looking to you to be having these kind of conversations. We're also doing quite a bit of work with telehealth and mHealth. This is a very sad case. There is a lot of breast cancer in Haiti. Um, Harvard's doing some work on this. We can't quite figure out why. Uh, it's such a tremendous rise. Um, this beautiful woman died at the old age of 36 and never got any care, never got a pain medication, not even a Tylenol. But what we try to do with the telehealth and the mHealth is that they'll take pictures and they'll interview, they'll send it to us, we'll find the medical team or we'll advise on what to do or try to hook up with our partners in Haiti just to try to get people health care. mHealth is, do you know what that is? Mobile health and that's using a cell phone. It is phenomenal what you can get done. Because of an, uh, cell phones we were able to have the guys uh, intervene with the team, intervene with a uh, chicken death outbreak. It turned out to be Newcastle disease. We partnered with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Emails, photos back and forth, they contained the quarantine because, or they quarantined the flocks because a dead chicken is poverty. A dead chicken is hunger. So um, we're working on that. So again, I don't know about the medical mission model. Um, going once a year, I don't know if these are the right things right. Um, I do know that we're trying to figure this out, and I'll tell you, it's soul searching, it's heart wrenching, it's difficult, it's hours upon hours of thinking and studying and listening. Uh, I'd love to hear all of your opinions. I love to listen to what Peter has to say and the team on the Global Health Advisory Committee. And until we turn over this rock of how we've been doing things, we may still be headed in the wrong direction. So we're working with a group of Haitians to create their own ag agency. It's called Sante, which is Health uh, Combit Together. And so this is Health Together for the community of Fondo, which is part of Leogon. And so in, in addition to our in-country work, we're having to do all the out-of-country work, which is we do some teaching of public health. We work with a fabulous aid organization, the supplier, which is Direct Relief International. Uh, I go around and speak to anybody who is stuck in the chair listening to me, and uh, we, we get supplies. Uh, mostly we're focusing on nurses because selfishly and, and probably a little boldly, we want to leverage nurses. If they're the largest healthcare workforce out there, Let's move them. Let's, let's get them mobilized. Let's get them the skills. Let's, let's do this. Written a book, uh, the main purpose of today, Leogon. This is the mass grave in Leogon. And being there for the one year anniversary about ripped my heart out. I, didn't, I really didn't think I could live after that. It was pretty, fell head over heels in love. So this book is about Haitians and how amazing Haitians are. It's not about Sanjay Gupta running in and saving. It's not about MSF. It's not about, it's about Haitians. And if we start seeing the people we have the privilege of working with as the heroes, as the brilliant, amazing people that they are, 
I could give you a whole lecture on how the International Aid Agency showed up on Sunday and just ran the Haitians over, just shoved them right out of the way and didn't work with them, didn't get it. They didn't know there were ambulance men that were working. They didn't know that there were teenage boys that were teaching classes to the children and providing the water. They were doing something magic with salt and batteries and I didn't know what it was, but they were getting us clean water. Just ran them over, shoved them right out of the way. So Haitians, Southern and Sudanese, Ecuadorians, they are their own heroes. It's their home, it's their culture, it's their life. And by their grace, we're invited into their homes. We also have an international journal. And um, I think this is a pretty pungent uh, quote from Wendell Berry, that while rats and roaches live by competition under the law of supply and demand, it is the privilege of human beings to live under the laws of justice and mercy. So my brilliant friend here, Regan, he said something to me the first morning of the earthquake when I was losing it and wondering what in the heck I had gotten myself into. Um, he touched my elbow, it was about 4.30 in the morning, it was pitch black, and nobody spoke English. I'll just tell you, this young man came up to me and touched my elbow and he said, it's so hard, I will go with you. And we did, we worked together. And if we learn to do that, it wasn't me as an outside person, I had the privilege of being there with Haitians, only Haitians knew where I was, only Haitians were helping Haitians, nobody showed up. So if we can learn that, it is so hard, let's go together. Not us together, all of us together. And uh, this is a beautiful sunrise up in Fondwa, and they truly believe another Haiti is possible, that's what they want, we need to listen to them. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time, and I know it's been a long day. Are there any questions? Yes. One behind you is Liz. Yeah. No, Liz, I was pointing to you. <laughs> As you know, uh, I'm even more my own about most of your positions as far as aid organizations and uh, research and all that kind of stuff. But, and I really believe what we need We should only be, you're absolutely right, we should only be, and that's such a wonderful question. It's one we struggle with, but we've been fortunate enough to, and I do think my relationship with Haiti is a little unique. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I knew my life depended on them. I really didn't think, I, none of us thought we were going to survive. And so you get that it's, it's that person on the left and person on the right, we're, we're family. And, and um, so I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard, and I got to know Haitians and they have their own leaders and it's our job to find them and ask them how do you want to do this to work together and sit and listen to what they have to say and let them be their community builders and I kind of see our role as kind of mentors in finding the resources they need. One gentleman, and I shared this with you the other day, uh, social determinants of health, we've got to uplift the economy. So as a nurse, I know a little bit about business, I know a little bit about that, but how on earth am I going to help some Haitian build microfinance? Well, he's actually, interestingly enough, it was, it was a connection, it's a long story, but he's selling Amway. And I was like, okay. You know, talk about globalization, but that's funding his microfinance so that he can pay his wages so that it, for his employees and so that he has loans to give out. And they do, just like uh, the Grayman Bank uh, found, they get 90% or more return on their loans. People in, you know, microfinance is an interesting model, but it's just been fascinating. So I guess in answer to your question, I'm still discovering it. I'm in phase three, and I just hope I live long enough to figure out phase three, and I don't really want a phase four. You know, that phase two was hard enough, but um, I think it's about 
tapping into your community leaders and developing strong relationships. And uh, if any of you have ever read Stephen Covey Jr.'s work on trust, it is about trust. It's and a lot of time. oh, it's it's very long time. It's years, it's, it's, like I said, it's the long, slow walking by someone's side instead of the flying in, got it for two weeks, drama, 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 go, come back again next year. Yeah. So did that answer your question sufficiently? Close. Close? Yeah, but it is about capacity, and we could do a whole section on how to build capacity in the social determinants of health. My job as a nurse may be more about building businesses than it is about taking blood pressures. My job may be more about facility, facilitating education than it might be. And as I suggested, we're working with chicken health, because if they can't eat, then who cares if I can give them a high blood pressure medication? Okay. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you wanted some comment from me, and, and I would underscore what you just said about capacity, because I think that is indeed the key. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, an approach done by a, an NGO, uh, and uh, this was the Namibia Development Trust that I encountered when I was in Namibia. And they, the work they did in Namibia was very interesting. And it was not entirely related to health, it was more a development kind of uh, initiative. But what they did is, they didn't provide a single thing to the community that they were working in until the community demanded it of them. So what they did first is they trained people in organizing, in setting up committees, and making sure women were involved in the committees. And then they said, if you want a shovel or if you want anything at all, you're going to have to come to us with a committee behind you to demand it. And then we will try to get it for you or provide it for you or we'll attack the, the source of, uh, uh, of those kinds of things, like we'll go to the government for it. I think that's an interesting way to deal with capacity. I think you're, on, you're, on, you're doing some of that yourself. You're on the right track. Well, and the, and the idea is, uh, let's say you do want to take a medical team in, and that's really your passion. I mean, you, that's what you have to offer. That's wonderful. But what if your medical team became, instead of 100% treatment, and diagnosing and treatment and a dispensing of medications, what if your medical team gets a little new mix in it and it's now 50% education and capacity building and 50% treatment? I mean, that, that's what we have to do when we go to Haiti. We take nurse practitioners because people expect that we're going to provide them medical care. Now, that becomes an ethical dilemma. We provide medical care. We screen you. We find this, you know, breast cancer. Now I've got to have money to make sure you get to that clinic. So it, it's a complicated issue. Is it even ethical to screen people and not have any way to provide the, the services for them? But what if our model is about capacity building, education, and that our team mix must be very different? And what if we're invited, we don't go set up in a community and decide we're going to be there? and we saw a need. Um, there's one aid organization that goes uh, twice a year for two weeks, and all the rest of the year there's no health care. And I wonder about that. It's awfully expensive to take in. I told you a team of 10 is 50,000. What do you think a team of 20 is? Because it's not inexpensive. Uh, gasoline in Haiti um, costs anywhere from 7 to $15 a gallon. And a set of tires costs around 500 to 1,000. So you're going to be driving around as an NGO. What are you doing with that money? So anyway. Well, I, th I think uh, this is, we could carry on. And I hope that some of you will indeed come and talk to Michelle individually. I know some of you are writing papers in my class, my other class, on, on topics related to the work that she's doing. Um, I, I'm one of those who have read her book. I strongly recommend that to you as well. Um, so I think this has been you know, a particularly uh, ruminating uh, lecture by Michelle Sarah. I think it's particularly wonderful that we could have a nurse come and speak to us. So we don't have just all these doctors, uh, but we have a nurse who's really given us a really insightful uh, presentation, but one that comes from the heart, too. I think that's what's especially special about it. 
what she had to share with us today. Um, so next week you're going to hear from someone who's neither a doctor nor a nurse. Uh, that's me. Um, and I'm going to be uh, talking about migration health. And I'm going to talk about place, access, and transnational competence. But uh, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on is, um, is war and violence. And one of those social determinants of health. Uh, and how armed conflict with deliberate not an earthquake, which is sort of beyond our control, but uh, something that's within our control has uh, had a huge effect on health around the world. So uh, join me again in thanking Michelle Sayre for the Thank you. And thanks again. Long day for you.